Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Eikhoff, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Associate Director of Alumni Relations at John Carroll University. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for our next installment of the John Carroll University Alumni Author Series. The Alumni Author Series was launched in November of 2020 as a way to highlight those who have written books, articles, poems, screenplays, and other written works within the JCU alumni community. Tonight, the Office of Alumni Relations, the John Carroll University Alumni Association, the Office of the Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and the Center for Student Diversity and Inclusion are proud to partner on this very special alumni author series in honor of National Coming Out Day. This evening, we are joined by Christopher Drajem, a member of the Carroll University class of 1990, who will share the memoir that he wrote with his mother, Wandering Close to Home. We're also joined by Tiffany Galvin Green, PhD, Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at John Carroll, who will lead the conversation. Before we start, I'd first like to introduce and welcome Megan wilson Wrights, a member of the John Carroll University class of 2009 graduate. Megan works alongside Tiffany in the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and she is here to read our, the land acknowledgement. Tiffany, I'm sorry, Megan. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Glad to see all of you. Um, today is, of course, um, celebrated across the United States as Columbus Day. Um, and for many communities that have, um, you know, are aware of the relationship of Columbus to a lot of um, problems with settler col colonialism and the um, plight of the indigenous across the United States, um, we want to acknowledge that in particular today. Um, before we enter into the rest of our conversation. And I want to acknowledge particularly um, the land on which we sit tonight. And so I'd like to share with you our land acknowledgement, which should be working, that's not it. Can everyone see the land acknowledgement that I am sharing? Okay. So um, John Carroll University sits on land that was originally stewarded by many Great Lakes tribes which may have included the Wyandotte, Lenape, Shawnee, Ottawa, Miami, Eel River, Wea, Chippewa, Potawatomi, Kickapoo, Piankasha, Kaskaskia, Mingo, Seneca, and Ojibwe people. We have few records of Northeast Ohio's original inhabitants, but thousands of Native Americans call this region their home today. And today we honor the land with respect for all those who have cared for it. Thank you, Megan. We appreciate you reading the land acknowledgement in recognition of Indigenous Peoples Day. It is an important day for sure. Uh, before I introduce our other guests, I want to share a few housekeeping items with you. First, we encourage you to view the program in full screen and speaker view mode. Uh, for those who need some help with that, this, uh, you should be able to select uh, your view in the upper right hand corner of the Zoom window. Additionally, please ensure that you stay muted throughout the duration of the conversation. Following the moderated conversation, we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers. Please utilize the chat feature for your questions. We will curate them and ask Christopher as many of them as possible. Thank you. I also wanna share a bit about Christopher's book, Wandering Close to Home. When Christopher came out to his parents in the mid 1990s, they did not disown him or force him into conversion therapy. When Linda had her feminist click around the same time, she did not leave her husband or her religion. Their worlds did not change completely, and yet they were turned upside down. The road to acceptance bridged a sea of negative social expectations and traversed a mountain of guilt. This collaborative memoir explores how each author left behind limiting outdated roles that no longer worked and kept only what mattered most, their individuality and their family. The book provides a map on how the authors questioned their religious beliefs, spoke truthfully to one another, even when it hurt, and continue to work together as a family in love. It is now my honor to introduce Christopher and Tiffany. Christopher Drajem, a class of 1990, uh, is a high school English teacher in the school district of Philadelphia. He and his husband, Patrick, are the proud parents of two wonderful teenagers, Isabella and Jordan. After having lived for many years in Seattle, Washington, the family recently moved to Philadelphia. Christopher and his mother, Linda, share their thoughts on parenting, religion, gender, and sexuality on the Dresden Family Writers Blog. Tiffany Galvin Green, PhD, serves as the Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at John Carroll University, where she oversees all matters of equity, inclusiveness, diversity, 
equal access, and the prevention of discrimination and harassment. Previously, Dr. Green uh, served as the Assistant Vice Provost for Inclusion Excellence at Vanderbilt University. She also has industry experience having served, uh, having been the CEO and Executive Director of River, uh, River Region Human Services, Inc. in Jacksonville, Florida, where she oversaw 13 nonprofit locations and 200 plus employees across three counties. Previous faculty appointments include the Eisenberg School of Management at the University of Massachusetts, Capella University, Minnesota, Flagler College in Florida, the University of Utah, University of Dal uh, Texas at Dallas, and the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. Dr. Green holds a PhD in organizational behavior and an MS in management and organizational behavior from Northwestern University and a BBA from the University of Michigan. Please join me in welcoming Christopher Drasium and Dr. Tiffany Galvin Green. Take it away. Thank you for that great introduction. Um, I have an advance. I'm having some interesting internet issues, but I hope you can hear me okay. A little choppy, but we, I think we're okay. Okay, uh, so I apologize for that. It might be the building I'm in. So Christopher, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's a real thrill to be here tonight. Well, we're anxious to jump in to hear more about your story and your journey. And you open up your book talking about sort of your decision to write the story with your mother. So I'd love to hear more if you could tell us all how that developed, sort of what has it been like from the beginning and any particular challenges or any pleasant surprises, we'd love to hear um, as um, people that are most interested in, in hearing from you on for a variety of reasons. Great, sure. Um, the, the process of putting this book together took quite a long time. Um, and that was for a variety of reasons. Uh, not the least of which is that um, when we really started to, th to think about writing a book together, I had just started my career as a high school English teacher. And um, very soon after that, my husband and I adopted our daughter. And then shortly after that, our son. So I had a few other things going on in my life. And um, Although I would have liked to put writing a book at the top of my priority list, it, it often sort of um, fell down a few pegs on the list. I think that um, the desire to write was something that um, I had for quite a long time. Um, at John Carroll, I was a member of the Carroll News staff and, and met um, some of my best friends at Carroll um, on the newspaper. Um, in senior year, I took a creative writing course um, that was offered by Mark Weingartner. Um, and those experiences really um, helped me to, to see myself as a writer. Um, which was something that I, I hadn't really considered up until that point. Um, my, uh, my mom was a high school English teacher as well um, and a writer as well. She primarily considers herself a poet, I think, um, and a poet who sort of dapples in nonfiction writing memoir, um, but her, her first love is poetry. Um, and I think that, you know, our, our love of writing and our love of literature and, and reading sort of led us together into the project. Um, and as we, we, as I wrote about in the introduction, you know, we, um, we saw this book um, that was written by a mother and uh, her gay son. Um, and that book um, sort of acted as the, the kernel of inspiration. Um, it was a, a memoir about the sun's coming out, written in the early 1990s, early to mid 1990s. Um, and I saw the book in a, in a bookstore one day and, and picked it up and sent it to my mom for Mother's Day. And, 
and wrote an inscription on the inside that said us next question mark. Um, and she thought that was pretty funny. She uh, didn't think that us writing a book, you know, really would would ever happen. Um, and and for many years that that seemed to be true. You know, we sort of uh, tossed the idea back and forth for a while, thought about what we might write about. Um, at, pretty early on, we thought that. Um, the the basis of the book would be letters that we had written back and forth to one another. Um, a few years after I graduated from John Carroll, I moved from Buffalo, where I was born and raised, to Seattle. Um, and this was the, the early to mid-1990s, so people were still um, actually writing letters at that point, and then uh, emails. Um, and we struck up a, a correspondence um, and we had this sort of trove of, of letters back and forth, um, particularly letters um, back and forth after uh, I came out um, and my sort of continued discussion of that and what that meant for me as a person. Um, and then letters back from, from my mom and my dad um, about their experiences and, and what they were, um, how they were sort of processing that information um, and, uh, and, 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 and what that meant for them as my parents um, and, and people who loved me and cared for me. Um, and so we, we thought for, for quite a long time that, you know, that maybe sort of gathering some of those letters together and, and piecing them together would, would be the core of the book. And then um, it, it evolved over, over quite a long time. Um, and we started to write a blog um, that dealt with more current issues related to, to uh, what Eric had mentioned earlier, um, sexuality, gender issues, um, religion, family, um, raising kids, marriage. Um, and that uh, blog, I think, helped us to, to, to continue to, to sort of mine our experiences um, and to really figure out what we wanted the book to, to ultimately be about. Um, I think that your question also asked about challenges and um, surprises. Oh, I think, uh, I think you might be muted. Yes, I said challenges that you've had or pleasant surprises since you made the decision and then you've been on this writing journey because I know yeah. that it is quite a commitment and then to do it um, with two two different voices, two different perspectives makes it interesting, but also, you know, adds a, a dimension to it. So I'd love to hear, you know, what, what has been some of the challenges, I won't call them lows, and some pleasant surprises. There were definitely challenges um, and some lows, for sure. Um, the one of my biggest challenges I, I sort of alluded to already was just finding the time to write. Um, and um, I think if it were up to me, the book still wouldn't be, um, wouldn't, wouldn't have been published because um, I, I still want to dig in there and, and do some more writing and, and, and editing and, and, um, and, and getting at maybe some more parts of, of my history and my family's history. Um, but you're right, like I, I did have this co-author who also happened to be my mother. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, if, if my experience is, is, any, um, is any judge of the situation, I would say definitely write a book with your, with your mother because um, it, it really was a wonderful experience, despite some challenges, despite, you know, trying to to come up with a, a cohesive book, as you mentioned, um, with two very different voices um, and deciding what kinds of things we were going to be writing about and encouraging one another to write about those things. Um, but but, you know, 
more than anything, the, the, the biggest pleasant surprise of this whole process was how it kept us connected um, and, and gave us something to, to think about and, and plan. And um, as we were writing about our, our individual experiences and our family experience, that was all feeding and nurturing our relationship. And so that, that was something that was, was really quite wonderful. Um, the, I would say the other main challenge in writing was, was writing about some experiences that I had growing up that for such a long time, I was really convinced I would never tell anyone. Um, you know, I, I think uh, there's there's two different experiences in the book that that for me were particularly difficult to write about, and and one was when I was um, was a younger child, and and um, and my mother caught me in her closet trying on some of her clothes, um, and I had so much shame around that experience for so long, um, and and had told myself and convinced myself that I would never speak about that um, and and knew and and sort of hoped and and prayed I guess in some way that my mother would forget it and and never um, talk about it with me um, so to sit down and and write about that and and have to confront that memory not only with my mother but then to have it go in into print for everybody to see, um, that was that was challenging, for sure, um, and also very rewarding, right? I think um, there's a real there's a real power in sort of claiming those moments in our lives when we are fully human, and that was a moment when I was a kid and I was drawn to these objects and I was, I didn't have any judgment around it um, at that time. I, it was just something that, that uh, I wanted to try and something I wanted to try on literally. Um, and I think that deciding to write about that and deciding to share it was uh, a story that needed to get told for the, the arc of the book. Um, and, and again, one that, that I found ultimately really um, powerful to share. The other uh, instance was um, writing about um, going up to a beach near Buffalo um, in Canada and, and really feeling like I was at a, a really low moment in my life and really struggling with my sexual orientation and really just at this crossroads. And, and I, I don't, I wouldn't say that, that I was uh, actively considering suicide, but I think it is fair to say that I was probably depressed and suicidal in some way. Um, so that particular low moment and, and um, again, once again, like deciding to share that, um, was was a struggle, but also, you know, uh, something that needed to be shared. Thank you um, for for sharing that. I think it's really important. You you highlight how this has been a bit of a therapeutic journey for you, not just a, a writing journey. And and your mention of of things that you've grappled with, sort of being your telling your authentic story and even admitting the lows as well as the highs. I think it's really important that we understand that, that those are, are stories that we have to tell as well. I mean, October is also Mental Health Month or Mental Health Awareness Month. And so um, I nicely kind of gave a, a, another example for us or another nugget for us to get from um, understanding that these kinds of stories that are very deeply personal, um, are also good demonstrations for how you can own your truth and, and own your stories. I think that that's quite valuable about um, what you have presented, what you and your mother have produced. Um, yeah, 
Thank you. Yeah, I agree. I think that that idea of ownership was was really something that that buoyed me throughout the process um, and knowing that I needed to own up to those things and that ultimately there there really was no shame in them or, or little shame in them. So, yeah, I agree. So um, you use a nice, unique um, writing technique, and then you said that you were inspired from the other book that you, you initially sent, but I, I wondered how you found sort of writing, telling, taking turn, telling your stories, how that evolved for you. Um, sounds very interesting to me, and I'll admit we have one thing in common. I've also gone down the journey of writing a book with my parents, and, and, and it can be quite a, a task of figuring out who's parenting who sometimes um, in the park. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you you do you do have that external accountability at the same time that you're trying to travel and I and it wasn't a memoir but it was still you it you do um, develop some interesting dynamics as you're telling a story together so sure. I'd love for you to share more about that dynamic or how you found using that um, turn taking style. Right. Well, it's. It's pretty interesting because um, the the book that inspired us, as as I mentioned, was was really about the experience of of this um, gay man and and how um, his family dealt with his coming out and and uh, the the mother was talking about the impact that that had on her own life and and for a long time um, we really considered writing a book that was in actuality, pretty much the same as that, just from our family's experience. Um, and, you know, one of the things that you do when you uh, start to write a book and start to think about getting it published is you have to think about who's going to read the book and then what they're interested in. And, and if there are other books that are similar, like what sets your book apart? And, um, that sort of idea of like what set our narrative apart was was percolating in in my mind and something that I was spending a lot of time thinking about and um, I, I write about this in the book as well but it, it was my lovely husband who said to me at one point in this you know this years long process he was like you know I hate to tell you this but like your coming out story is it's really just not that interesting like there's a lot of other coming out stories out there. It's been written, it's been done. You know, there's this other book that you've admitted to being inspired by, like you need something different. And oh, by the way, it's your mom's story too. And you both really need to consider that. Um, and you need to center her story more and have her story about her own journey, her coming out story as well, coming out or coming into her identity as a feminist and what that meant for her um, is, is a story that, that she needs to tell and can also tell how her role as mother um, and, and, and being your mother um, during this time of change for you what that was like, um, but but there needs to be more of her story there, um, and and that was just such great advice. Um, it really helped to shift the book and to to kick it into gear in terms of giving us a, a firmer idea about what the story was that we were trying to tell, um, and it was not something that my mother really wanted to hear quite frankly. Um, mm. It took some encouragement from me and from my husband and from an editor that we worked with to really um, see her story as one that um, was valuable and that did have some meaning and did have a place in this greater arc of, a, of our family's history. Um, just as, you know, just as I felt like uh, just as I had agreed with my husband and was like, yeah, my, my coming out story is pretty, pretty bland, pretty vanilla. You know, I, 
like Eric read in the in the intro, I didn't get kicked out. My parents, you know, were huge supporters of me and I'll always have been. Um, my mom also felt something very similar. She said, you know, my story has been told and, and, and I'm not this huge feminist icon that anybody really wants or, or needs to, to hear from. Um, and so the idea of um, really centering both of our stories was, was uh, it was tense. There was, there was tension there. There was me saying, no, 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 you have to write about this. You know, this is really important. You know, like you need to, to share these experiences that you've had um, with your granddaughters. You need to talk about um, this, uh, again, going back to mental health. You need to talk about what it was like to grow up in a family with a mom who had uh, two or three nervous breakdowns. Um, and the impact that that had on you as a as a young woman, you have to talk about the fact that um, you know you were breaking the mold by going to college and having a career for yourself, um, and and that was a strange experience in a lot of ways because. Um, you know, this is when we were writing the book, and it's it's years after my mom had sort of had this would is referred to, and, and she'll call it this, her feminist click, where she is recognizing herself as a, as a part of the um, feminist movement. And, um, and it, it was strange to me to, to see myself in the role of trying to encourage her to tell her story more. Um, and so I felt like she was maybe in some ways still trying to be a protective mother, um, still trying to maybe downplay her own story and put herself to the side and, and shine the light on me. Um, but I really felt like her story was just as important um, and that the, the heart of the story, the kernel of the story was um, how we were both going through periods of transformation, both going through periods of great change, and decided to let each other in on that process, and ultimately how we supported one another during that process um, at a, a, a time of great personal change. Well, that's pretty powerful. I, I, I... I saw you use the phrase earlier too about how it was a, a coming out story for the both of you, which I think is really interesting because there are many ways in which we fight to be authentically ourselves, to be, be feel okay being ourselves, and and to work against how society may be determined to define us differently. And so you have two different versions of that, but very similar in a different way. And I think you said too that the two of you were able to validate each other's truths and stories at the same time, which is really what becomes crucial about um, coming out as well is that you feel um, there's there's many parts to it, of course, in terms of, of, of freeing and being authentically you, but at some point feeling that validation that it's that your story matters, that, right. that your matters. And so you all have that and then tell the story that, and, and in writing the story, you, you develop that at the same time, which is really powerful. Did you have um, particular hopes about what you thought the, the impact of, of this, this story would be or, or both stories would be? Uh, you mean beyond like winning the National Book Award or something like that? I'm assuming. Well, you can you can that you can include that as well. Yes. <laughs> um, I think that ultimately we sort of going along with this idea that that we've just been talking about, but like centering your story and how that validates the story and validates your own experience. I think um, both of us as teachers, and, and here I'll be talking for my mom, and that's that's not really that great, but um, I think we both sort of 
put on at least partially our teacher hat and said, if we can share our experience and have that experience um, be in some ways a model for how others can respond in similarly challenging situations, that would be great. Um, and we're gonna try and put this story forward um, as an example. Um, and it, I think, you know, for me, that's, that's really, that's really where, where it, it is, is, is um, seeing the, the, the story for what it is, um, uh, one person's story, two people's story, my story, her story, um, and then the story of our family. Um, but, but, you know, that's, that's tiny in some ways it's 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 us and it's our own individual experience and if that can serve as an example of it, if it can be uh one model that's out there of how two people responded and a, and a family um came along then then that's wonderful um i i think there's another part of me that really, uh, I think, sort of selfishly um, just wanted to write because it was in some ways cathartic. Um, and the process of, of writing my story down helped me to make sense of myself um, and helped me to, to sort of, as I mentioned before, kind of claim some of those moments in my life that I had always felt shame around. Um, and, and then there's also a part that wanted to create a, a, a sort of time capsule and a, 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 a family album for my own kids and for their kids. Um, and so it became really important um, in, in that regard to make sure that the story was really specifically centered at a particular time in a particular place. Um, we both went out of our way to try to bring to life for, for my mom, the 1950s, the 1960s and what was going on. Um, for me, the, the 80s and 90s um, and, and what was happening in those particular time periods. Um, and to center the book where, where it was, which was Buffalo and then also Seattle. Um, and, and what that idea of, of place meant to us um, and how that contributed to, to our stories. Um, so so I, think, I think those things and, and not necessarily the National Book Award, there was no, no illusion that um, that, that was gonna happen, but, but that's fine. I think um, I kind of like that it was published by this small publishing house in Buffalo. It's um, really sort of brought it back home, literally and figuratively. And, um, and the response that we've gotten has just been really wonderful. So it's, it, it has achieved that piece of, of um, impacting people or, or resonating with people. I don't, I, I don't want to say impacting, but at least resonating with people, which is, which is wonderful. Okay, I want to challenge you a bit on something you said earlier, where you said when you started out, you were told by your uh, husband that your particular coming out story may not be that unique or interesting. Because I think some of us that have tuned in today really want to hear a little bit more about how you've negotiated life as a gay man. I, you speak about some of it being along with, um, particularly in the decades and the changes that were going on outside, but just more about your personal experience, your relationships, um, things that, that you can relate to or that might be relatable to um, others that are on the call that also have similar experiences, they'd like to hear about your journey. Sure. So yeah. I'm going to push back and say, your story is interesting. You want to hear more about it? <laughs> um, well, I, 
I lived in the closet for a long, long time. I think um, like many gay people, um, many people who who struggle with their sexual orientation or question their sexual orientation, they, they have an idea um, pretty early on that what not that they might be sexually attracted to somebody of the same sex, but that that they're different. And I, I did feel different from a pretty early age. Um, but I was, you know, I had gotten these messages from society and from my religion and, and quite frankly, from my family that, that that was, you know, that was wrong. It was morally wrong. It was against my religion. I was raised Catholic. Um, and it was something that um, society in the, you know, the 70s, 80s, and up through the mid 90s was really, there were lots of negative messages and not a whole lot of positive portrayals of, of gay people um, in, in society. Um, so I did what many people do and I, played pretend and I, I dated girls in high school and I dated some young women in college and um, after college, I had some serious relationships with women who, um, who I loved. Um, it was just that there was always this piece that was not quite fulfilling enough. Um, and I think in some ways, uh, those relationships um, became sort of this thing that I was trying to prove, right? And I could say to myself, um, see, if you're, if you're dating women, then this attraction that you have to men is, it's just, it's passing. It's, it's going to, it's going to go away. Um, you'll outgrow it. That was sort of a, a one theory that was fairly popular at the time that um, some young men have these attractions, but um, they outgrow them. Um, and so there were all of these things going, going on for me. Um, and um, particularly when I was at John Carroll, I had a very close group of friends some of whom I think are on this call tonight, um, who I love dearly um, and are super supportive of me and my family. But it was my own decision to, to not tell them what was going on in my life. Um, and I really, all the way through John Carroll, really sort of uh, didn't go there. I kept that part of myself closed off. I convinced myself that it was something I was gonna outgrow. I sought counseling from uh, a couple of Jesuit priests um, who, who helped to reinforce that idea that it might be something I could outgrow. Um, and uh, I, I basically convinced myself that this was something about me that I could change. Um, I think after I graduated, I started to, to really question that idea. I was getting older and the desires weren't going away. <laughs> so the idea that I was gonna outgrow it was like, well, when's that gonna happen? Cause time's a tick in here. Um, and, um, and, and as a, you know, as a, a fully mature adult, I was, starting to, to get a, a, a better sense of myself and to really see that, um, no, this, this wasn't a sin. I wasn't sinful. I was a, I was a good and decent person, you know, completely human with lots of faults for sure. Um, but, but being gay wasn't one of them. And, um, uh, you know, that, that took some, exploration, some reading. Um, there were still lots of negative messages, even within the scientific and medical community at that time. And certainly that was reflected in, um, in the media and, and in, um, in movies and TV. Um, and, you know, there was also this horrible disease that was spreading through the gay community at that time. 
um, and some some pretty horrible things that were being said about people who had AIDS and were HIV positive. Um, but I think also it was the sort of ridiculousness of those comments um, and the hypocrisy that came with some of those comments um, that, that really, I don't know if, if it's fair to say they were a catalyst, but they were one more reason to say, you know what, this is, this is just ridiculous. Um, for lack of a better word. And um, this thing that's going on about who you are is, is who you are, it's not gonna change and it's okay. Um, and, and I do think that um, it took in some ways for me moving from Buffalo to Seattle to, to fully feel that idea of it's okay in my bones. There was something about needing to uh, launch myself far from home um, that that helped to to push me um, to to come out to finally come out and um, Seattle is just a, you know was just a a very different place from Buffalo and I remember. Um, I remember a conversation that I had with my brother um, not too long after I came out where, where I said to him, you know, it's, it's just not a big deal here. Like I, I, you know, I tell people and it's like, they don't even really care. It's not, it's just like another aspect of your personality and, and it, it's, it doesn't impact anything. Um, and, and that was sort of a, a, a revelation for me. Um, so, um, after, I, I guess, I guess that's the long story of my coming out and I haven't, I mean, the, the particulars are, you know, I, I came out to my parents when I was visiting Buffalo, um, for a, a, a birthday party for my grandfather. Um, and somehow I convinced myself that coming out to my mom on the, the day that she was hosting this big party would be a good idea. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, I, I think both of my parents were, were surprised, but, but probably not. Um, they had seen me date women. They had thought that in particular I was going to get engaged to a woman who I had dated in Buffalo and um, this in some ways was surprising to them but but then on on closer reflection probably not really um, and um, yeah I don't know I I guess that's that's what I'll share and then the rest is in the book <laughs> So um, you came out while you were at JCU? No, not while I was at JCU. Um, it was after. Um, yeah, I was, I was, I wasn't out to anybody at, at John Carroll at all. So how have things changed for you um, in terms of how you negotiate life on the other side? Um, so there was the coming out story, but there's then everything else that you've also been able to speak to you talked a little bit about how you wanted to share parts of your story to talk about um, things that were important to you as you developed as a parent and you know navigating in that space I think there's a lot of um, interest even then in sort of how um, you've developed past the coming out to sort of through other stages negotiating life as a, as a gay man and through all of its you know we know things have changed societally in some ways and in a lot of ways not. Right. Um, yeah, I think that, um, you know, I think after coming out, um, it, it pretty quickly became really important to me to 
not be closeted at all. Um, and that did and has sort of informed my experiences since then. Um, after living for, for so long in the closet and for, for not, for, for having this sort of dual existence is the, the best way I can describe it. Um, I didn't want to do that anymore and I didn't want to do it in, in any situation. So, um, for example, um, I came out in job interviews and specifically asked principals of schools where I was going to teach what the environment would be like for a gay staff member. Um, every year on the first day of class, I'll always talk about my husband and, and my children. And so um, I, I, I don't want to hide that aspect of myself because um, for me, you know, the straight people in my life don't hide the fact that they're straight. Um, and so um, I don't see why, why I should be hiding that information either. Um, I, I think um, my kids will tell you, particularly my daughter will, will kind of roll her eyes and be like, all right, we get it, you're gay. Um, you know, she's, she's kind of over it um, at this point. Um, and, and we'll sort of, you know, poke fun at my husband and I, um, for anything that we do that is sort of stereotypically gay, um, which just feels like such a lovely, a lovely thing, right. Um, to be able to, to joke about it and to be able to, um, give us a hard time about it really like it <laughs> it it warms me um in so many ways because it's it's so different from from my experience right um and um this sort of goes back to um to to something that we were talking about before about uh challenges in in writing the book and in a a specific another specific challenge was was really writing um, about how hard it was to grow up in my family and in my community with all of the negative messages that I was getting. Um, and, and that's not to say that, that um, you know, that I, I was beaten up uh, because I wasn't, but, but there's that sort of casual, like, uh, you know, it, it was acceptable at that time um, when I was a, a kid and a teen to just sort of say, oh, that's so gay or, um, ah, you're such a fag or, or whatever, like these horrible things that, that we just took as, as you know, as normal. Um, um, and and that, was, that was damaging and demeaning and to, to um, be able to, to say that in the book and to say, no, that, that was hurtful. And uh, my parents kind of fell down on the job. Not that they're bad people, because they're not, and not that they didn't do a great job parenting because they did, but in that respect, um, you know, they, they, they weren't doing what they needed to do. And there's tons of reasons for that, right? Like there's, again, it gets back to what the, what the time period was like and, and what um, perhaps their religion was telling them or, or whatever. But um, I think the, the, the casual sort of levity around pointing out my gayness that my daughter has um, is really contrasts with that sort of horrible demeaning um, casualness that, that I grew up with. And, and again, it's just, it's, it's a lovely thing. Um, and, um, I guess in just in, in other ways that, that I've dealt with it, I've, I've tried to, um, to bring more diverse books and discussions into the classroom with me as a teacher. 
Um, I've done some, some work providing trainings and support for other um, gay couples who are in the process of adopting um, and just tried to raise awareness through the, our, our blog about some of the harmful um, rhetoric that gets tossed about still, as you mentioned, things aren't completely great. And, and there's always, I fear, just a, a worry that um, the backlash can, can still be pretty fierce. So there's a couple of people that have sent in some questions. And then to give you fair warning, there's also been a request that maybe you have an excerpt from your book you'd like to share. Um, I was going to ask if you had a favorite portion, but um, but before, you know, giving you a minute for that, um, I would open it up for any others that might have a, a question that we hadn't covered. Maybe I could ask a question that came in while you were talking, um, which is that um, we, we have a number of students, current John Carroll students on this call, and um, what advice might you have for them? Um, what suggestions might you have to students who are currently listening to you? Um, or perhaps what might you do differently uh, if you could go back and be a John Carroll student all over again? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, this is so hard and it, it really sort of breaks my heart. My, you know, my 53 year old self here in, in 2021 says, to my 18, 19 year old self in 1986, like come out, right? Like give people the benefit of the doubt, like let them in in this particular way. And, and that just, there's sort of a, that's sort of unfair to do, right? Like my whole life led me to where it led me at that particular point and um, some little, twinkle in my ear saying, just come out, wasn't gonna change anything, right, at that moment. Um, but, but what I would say to, to students now and, and what I say to my students is, find those people in your, in your life who, who you think are gonna be safe people and who you feel comfortable talking to and, um, and, and share as much as you want with them. Um, you know, I, I said that I was closeted through high school and, and college, but um, I did have some tentative conversations about my wonderings and questioning with people who I knew um, were also having similar questioning questions and, and wonderings in their own lives. And, and those conversations were 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 lovely and were small lifelines that um, that that helped pull me through. Um, but but I would say you know find find people and find resources. There's plenty out there that's written. Um, the internet is amazing, um, and um, and read as much as you can talk as much as you as you can um, and and find find your community find your family um, and also do give people the benefit of the doubt um, and and ultimately um, you know that that was the road that I went down and and the the friends um, my friends from John Carroll have been nothing but supportive of me and my family. Um, and, you know, my, my, uh, 85 year old grandparents were, were both really, um, supportive when I, when I came out to them, um, you know, 20 years ago. So. I think we have or should we ask for the reading now? <laughs> Do you have a section in the book you'd like to read? We'd love to sure, hear. Sure, sure. Um, uh, 
let's see. Um, Well, I'll read, um, yeah, I'll read this short uh, excerpt from um, uh, section later on in the book, chapter 16. Um, and this is about um, uh, meeting my husband. If you were a gay male living in Seattle in the 1990s, the place to be on a Saturday night was Neighbors, a club on Capitol Hill. Beer was cheap, men stripped off their shirts and showed their gym-toned bodies. And by midnight, everyone was dancing, arms in the air, young and free and alive. I dated a guy who shared a house with another guy who was an aspiring DJ. And during the week, he would retreat to the basement to practice mixing songs. During the day, both went off to office jobs, but on Saturday nights, the three of us often ended up at neighbors, drinking and dancing. I hated it there. I hated going to the gym so I didn't have a body to show off. I hated the way I danced. I hated the way men leered at one another. I hated that I didn't feel comfortable leering back. My idea of a great Saturday night was going out to dinner with friends and then going to the movies or a play. One actor I kept seeing on stage was this guy named Patrick Sexton. We met briefly at an audition for a play shortly after I moved to Seattle in 1993. He got the part and I went on to a few other plays in small fringe theaters. Over the next few years, I saw him in several plays and was always transfixed. I developed a bit of a crush. Patrick had magnetism and energy on stage that was compelling. I found him devastatingly handsome. In the fall of 1996, I started working as a teaching artist for the Seattle Repertory Theater. At a training workshop, I ran into Patrick, who was also a teaching artist that year. Patrick was no less magnetic in person than he was on stage. He was kind, engaging, and a great listener. And he laughed at my jokes, a big, hearty, throw his head back laugh that made me swoon. Our first date was on Father's Day in 1997. Neither of us was spending any time with our fathers that day. Mine was in Buffalo, probably crying over his grill because neither of his sons was there to celebrate him. Patrick's father had died of cancer 10 years earlier. Our talk, however, did turn to fatherhood. I'm the oldest of six kids, plus two steps, Patrick said. I don't know how my mom managed because my dad drank a lot and commuted two hours each way to work from Long Island to New Jersey. When I have kids, I don't want more than three. You wanna be a dad too? When I came out, my mom made me promise I would have children someday. This is not usually first date conversation, especially not for two gay men in 1997. Having children was the furthest thing from the minds of many gay men. Neither of us knew any gay men, single or coupled who were raising children. But the idea that I had met someone else who wanted children as much as I did was very attractive to me. Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing that part and piquing our interest a little bit more. I know well, we may be getting close to time, but I really have appreciated and enjoyed hearing about your journey, both in writing and well, personally. Um, I didn't know if there were any other um, questions or if I, to turn things back over to Eric. Well, I'll, I'll take it from here. Um, Christopher and Tiffany, just thank you so much for taking time out of your evening uh, to be with us. Uh, it was a truly wonderful and inspirational conversation. So thank you again. Uh, Christopher, your story is so powerful. And um, I know those on the call and those um, uh, we will be sharing with will enjoy learning more about your experience uh, both in writing and coming out uh, so thank you for sharing that journey with us and Tiffany um, thank you for your leadership at, at John Carroll and partnering on this program and so many other programs that we've had over the course of the last 
uh, two years now. We are incredibly fortunate to have both of you uh, within our John Carroll University community. Um, before we conclude, uh, I want to remind you of um, a few other upcoming gatherings that you can take advantage of, actually both next week. Um, uh, for those who are in Cleveland, on Tuesday, October 19th, uh, our Cleveland Alumni Chapter is hosting a panel discussion uh, focusing on the future of Cleveland. How will Cleveland arise, um, arise after the pandemic? Uh, the panel includes alumni who work at Sherwin-Williams, Destination Cleveland, the City Club, and Greater Cleveland Partnerships. The program will take uh, in, take place in person under that tent over by the Dolan Center for Science and Technology. It is open to any member of the John Carroll community if you're interested in joining us, students, alums, parents alike. On Thursday, October 21st, we'll host another panel discussion. Uh, this time, uh, we'll be focusing on current trends in marketing and communication. It will, it will feature three alums, all who have prominent roles in various marketing and communication firms, uh, two in Cleveland and one in Buffalo, uh, and it will be hosted by Dr. Peggy Finucan. Uh, it will be on Zoom. And then finally, I just want to make sure that you're all aware, we have a wonderful array of different types of programs uh, that we record and put on our John Carroll University uh, YouTube channel. Uh, go on YouTube, search JCU alumni uh, or John Carroll University alumni and check out a ton of different types of programs, our alumni author series, JCU Junior, ACES, our alumni continuing education series, God and All Things, uh, and our alumni spotlights. Also, please consider a charitable gift to John Carroll in support of our students, our faculty, and our entire campus community. If you've already made a gift this year, thank you for your generosity. If you have not, please join me in supporting John Carroll so that our current and future Blue Streaks will have an impactful and wonderful uh, education grounded in the Jesuit tradition. You can make a donation by visiting jcu.edu backslash give. Christopher, Tiffany, thank you again. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, take care, be well, most importantly, stay safe, and onward on John Carroll.